all we got. Uh, and so it, 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 COVID has escorted drama away from the church. We don't have theater in the church. Now we have to have substance of things hoped for. So preachers who are lazy are going to be exposed. Preachers who are not prepared, the sheets are coming off of them. Those who are not in consecration are going to be hitting their head up against the wall because it's just you and that camera. Because we, we, where is the work of the ministry? Where, where is, where is the mark of the high calling? Where is, where is I lay down my life for my friend? Where is that? Where is that? You, it's, it's a trickery. It is smoking mirrors. It's tricks. It's foolishness. And it does not last long. It's not going to be a work that has any kind of legacy to it. That has any kind of credibility. <laughs> We talk about your credibilities on the line. It's not gonna. It's not gonna have any integrity to it because you're too busy wanting to be seen. The last I said, the last I heard, that if you lift God up, God will draw a men unto you. That's right. and so I'd rather people be mad than black Jesus be mad. And just for the people in the, in the cheap seats, my Jesus is black. Always been black. My Jesus come from the hood. Know how much got, got the milk costs. Where's uptowns? My Jesus from the people. My Jesus is li a, a liberator of the people and breaker of chains. I'm just saying. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome hello. all. My sisters, how y'all doing today? Awesome. Hello, 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 everybody. You say awesome, Crip. You just well, waving. Well, I, well, I, well. How, how you doing, Crip? Good afternoon. I am doing very well. Excuse me. I'm driving now, and I'm off of a walker, and I'm on a cane. Three oh. weeks after surgery. Today is my third week of, from surgery. Awesome. So will I have this wow. done again? Mm, in a year, maybe. I need Any year, but I'm good. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> We're happy for you, girlfriend. Three weeks. Yeah, that's the spunky one there. That's the spunky one. <laughs> <laughs> well, while y'all trying to figure out, well. I need to. I need to start a GoFundMe account. GoFundMe account. I had to. Um, um, so some of you all know, others don't that I, um, I um, adopted a rescue um, dog during the, the pandemic back in the spring. And, and he's adorable, he's an older dog and, and it's just great. But, um, so, but he's have been having this coughing issue. Y'all know how I am by the cough, right? Oh Jesus, all right, pray for me. But he's been having this coughing issue. So I taken him, got him taken care of, but then had to take him to a vet again. <laughs> Today at the vet, all right? He, the dog had to have x-rays and blood work. When I got that bill, I was I wanted to say y'all can keep him, right? Y'all <laughs> okay. What? That's, what? Okay, so I need to start a GoFundMe account. All right. So I just need y'all to Google. I gotta figure out what the name gonna be. You know, rescue dog, you know, don't want to pay the bill, go fund me. I got it, but but y'all, the dog needed x-rays and blood work. Of course. Mm. Jesus. Well, Dr. Burns, I'm going to tell you, honestly, my husband's dog has his own insurance. That's what I... So if he, right. he needs me. help, he gets to go to the animal hospital because he got insurance. <laughs> well... Wait, wait, well, wait, wait, yeah, wait, well, wait, wait, wait. isn't there some insurance? No. Wait, we got a we got a governor that don't even want folk to have. I'm sorry, the dog got insurance. Okay. Wait. No, wait, wait. I'm I can't get past that. Doggy insurance. Absolutely. I'm hey, telling you right now, Pastor Stewart's dog. Uh, Pastor Stewart Wright's dog has his own wait. insurance. My wait. sister's dog has his insurance. <laughs> I need you to look in the comment section. <laughs> Obviously, I'm the only one who didn't know about doggy insurance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in yes. the Get the pet smart health insurance. Yeah. Okay, so I, I need to know yeah. is the dog is the dog insurance HMO or PPO? <laughs> Can I choose my own bed? Okay, I need to know. Y'all 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 inform me. What <laughs> the vet will tell you what type of insurance to get. 
I'm weak. I love it. PPO. <laughs> what, what they call it? DDO? I don't, what is it? <laughs> yeah. Pastor Burns wants to know is, it, is the dog insurance PPO or DDO? <laughs> I'm trying to understand. Oh, yeah. Do I, do I yes, have to pay yes. $10 Get your or $1,000 a month? Girl, it's about, it's about $24, $25 a month. No, That's I mean, well, I'm telling y'all, y'all, I want, I want, I want to go in reverse. They didn't have that chip in them, you know, that they could, they could still figure out where, where the owner was. I think I would have left that dog this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Cross <laughs> on your mammogram, your blood work, and all of that. Okay. All right. What? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is really a thing. People are saying both are available. You have to wait for open enrollment. What? Oh, no. Open enrollment. Yes. But they can't have existing problems. They, are you young and really? Really? And Melissa, yeah, he's, he's about eight years old, Melissa. Problems. Pass my head. It's for healthy dogs. Blood work and x-rays for real it makes you seek the <laughs> Seek the Lord. Mm-hmm. Hey, I, I need to, okay, so I need to know from any of you all who are dog lovers. Tell me this: Can you take the chip out of them? Can the chip be removed? Okay, can you take the chip out of the dog. <laughs> yeah, can you take the chip out, uh, out of the dog? Okay, well, so that way not. they can't tra- that way they can't trace them back to me. Wait, they can't trace said, him back how, to you. <laughs> Oh my goodness! People, employers offer uh, pet insurance, but um, people don't even have insurance. See. Y'all, this messed up for real. So many people don't have insurance, and Let y'all, me, wow! You actually have to but, have but, IV. But, but but trust me, y'all y'all put <laughs> y'all y'all put in the chat um, <laughs> the, the different places. I saw somebody said pet code, but I like my vet. I need to be able to keep my vet. You can keep okay. your vet, just get the dog insurance. Oh, so if you get if you get certain type of insurance, this means you won't be able to have your own dot own vet. Oh my god. Right, <laughs> right. Hey, hey. But see, Who, my, my dog has many, his own how many, how many of those other people, clear people have pets and they all it's have insurance? <laughs> they all have insurance. Did she just call these people clear people? <laughs> clear people, a lot of them are the ones making these rules. A, a lot, Doctor Wallace, a lot. But my my baby has. Now listen, he's not a pup. He's an old dog. I I knew he was an old dog when I I I mean, but he was good. But that he mm. first of all, y'all. I mean, the dog call. Those of you who know me know I am with a call. Uh uh-uh, uh, wait. <laughs> you, you get up out of here. Oh. Get, get up out of here. <laughs> I'm weak. It. I am so weak. That okay, is so too funny. Well, so what I mean, oh, they say nationwide insurance has dog insurance. Look at that. Nationwide has hey, dog insurance. Our, I like our it. viewers know more about dog insurance, I tell you. Wow. Wow. Could y'all yeah, please well, yeah. go fund Dr. Burns and assist her with the meal <laughs> for this dog? All the dog That's lovers really out there need to rally I don't think I've and had assist, it. Uh, assist her with them dog. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing. I, I don't that. I don't have any animals. Um, nothing against them, but I don't have them in my house. Um, because when I was younger, I had a dog, um, had two dogs and I, they weren't mine. They were my brothers and I had to take care of them. So mm-mm, nope, I will not have another dog in my house. So wow. mix the dog conversation. <clears throat> no, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. I got to ask this question. Benadryl, you can give your dog Benadryl? Absolutely. Anything you take, you can oh, give dog. Oh, y'all need to stop. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes, anything, well, any medication you take, you can get a dog, that, and that will save you from them X-rays Dr. and blood work. <laughs> Doctor Wallace, so now I, my I mother believe. did give my Father John's cough syrup when I was little. See now what I'm that Father about? John's cough syrup got that good cod liver oil in it. 
That's some hey, good. Father John's does a lot of things. Pastor Stallworth, stop it. <laughs> It'll make a believer out of you. Stallworth, stop it. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're not listening to you. We're not dealing with you. Stop it. I think that um, this conversation is <laughs> is about to be over, and we're moving on to something else. <laughs> You're doing the today, Dr. Callis. Trazodone. Because, um, yeah, no, stop Whoa. it. Oh. I'm not dealing with it anymore. We, Melissa, Melissa. We, want, we, pull up. we want the dog to get up. She said dogs are less trouble than men. I'm weak. That's what she said. That's I'm weak. Okay, let me just put a pause right I got, here now. I got both. <laughs> let, me, let me put a pause in here right now. I got both. Say, okay. <laughs> We're done with it. Um, oh, th no thank plan. you, Lord. Well, oh, I am so grateful oh, that all of you decided oh, to join us today. Um, it is wonderful to see all of you, um, but this this doggy stuff <laughs> got to go. <laughs> wait a minute, child. Wait a minute. Hold on, child. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm on Sesame Street now. Three of us. No, go ahead. Let's talk. No, go ahead. Come, come on, just say it. Got to go. Gotta go wait. Right. Do, do you wait see? A minute, I think he knew I was talking about because he just got it, y'all. He just got up and left the room. Ooh, okay. Ooh, ooh. Oh, thank goodness. So they we can move on sense. to something else. They do have good sense. Have you have you had an opportunity to um to see the documentary, the Oprah Winfrey documentary? Um on Megan and uh, Harry. Megan Markle. <laughs> Bits and pieces. Yes. I, I am I, I think, did see the documentary. Okay. So what did you the parts that you did see. What did you think about it? Hush, Brenda. Move on. <laughs> it's, the, it's the comments. I feel, I feel like uh, all this right here, <laughs> Dr. Burns, you have started something that look. <laughs> it, it was not me, I promise. Everybody upset about Wolfie. <laughs> <laughs> but back to the interview with Megan, Megan and Harry. I don't see any reason why this girl needed to lie about anything. I do believe a, a, a comment that Harry made that concerned me was this. I don't want to see history re repeat itself. To me, he felt like his wife was in danger, the same danger that his mama was in with his daddy's foolishness. Mm -hmm. And he felt he needed to do what he had to do to protect her. Bravo, Harry. I do. Well, it's real love. Um, it says black women always on attack. You get tired of that. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Stallworth said Oprah reminded us just why she was Oprah in case we forgot. Mm -hmm. she, was she absolutely wonderful, wonderful interview when um Megan spoke of um, them questioning her or said, I hope, I wonder what color the baby is going to be. I hope the baby is not too dark. And that, mm -hmm. um, really? Now, mind you, her, her mama's dark. And at the end of the day, that baby could look like X, Y, Z if it's in the bloodline. So there's no guarantee. He won't darken up a little way down the road. And guess what? Now we got a girl and she probably be a cute little chocolate drop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all need, need Jesus. I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> <laughs> we need Jesus. Oh, okay. We just us, not you and the dog. <laughs> uh, I think that when when we understand. I mean, it's it's his. Well, you did say history repeating stuff. It just it happens all the time. When black women are always under under attack, mental health is still an issue. Um, she wasn't allowed the help that she needed. Um, mm -hmm. The institute. Right. No, you're you'll taint the institute. No, you can't do it because of the institute. What do you mean? I need help. Mm -hmm. I need help, and um, this he, is this is a cry for help. So I'm leave. We're leaving this joint and going to California. How about that? Mm -hmm. 
So that's but exactly the other side of that is Prince William mm -hmm. and Kate. William and Kate have an organization that they fund that deals with mental illness, but you couldn't help her. You had oh, nothing well. to offer her. Mm. Mm. Yeah, part of That's the a dangerous was, thing. The piece of the interview or the reporting that I saw on, on it was about her really feeling like she wanted to commit suicide. She didn't want to live. And I think yes, that's sad. She did that's not want to live. Um, oh, doc, Dr. Noreen, did you catch that? Do you think that happened to Lady? Oh, she was ostracized in, in the Institute. She was oh, ostracized. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's why oh, she yes. was trying to get away. To the same degree, but yes, she was definitely um, mistreated in that royal family. Yes. I, I really believe and somebody had that's, And that's why he said he was concerned about history repeating itself. He said, y'all not going to treat my wife like you did my mama. Yeah. And too many times we think children don't see things, mm -hmm. but children, <laughs> they're a whole lot smarter than we give them credit for. They're not missing yeah. a beat. And the one thing, one of the commentaries I heard, though, was that people wanted to excommunicate him uh, from Britain, but yet he served in the military. Walk mm -hmm. behind his mama's hearse, yes. and then you want to excommunicate him? No, he's been a, he's been a royal. All and the way in the ditches, but the and kid, he, and he's worked on A's across around the world. Yes, yeah. he, 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 he's a but stand up he, guy in my book. I agree, but what did they say? They said that well, he's not going to have a title. He's not going to be. He's going to be. I mean, really? You tell so, you're saying this hey, too. Guess what? I would say so. What? Who, who cares? That's right. Who Take cares? some money and go. It'll run a long way in California. How about that? Because she already got her money. So well, well, yeah, now, they'll live. They'll live well. One of the things that um, I think it was um, Chrishell, She said all the while. Um. The father, Charles, Prince Charles, is he remains guiltless. Mm -hmm. He remains guiltless. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he has a he had a mistress. He probably still has one, but don't you know? Yeah, Camille, she's still out in there, out there, in there. Had had a mistress. Now he married the mistress, and now he won't talk to the son. His son is not talking to Harry. Uh, Prince William is not talking to Harry. I mean, really. That something something else is up. He is protecting his wife, and that's probably the reason why. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, let me say this to to our um, to those of you who are watching. Our guest is running. I'm just a few minutes late, Dr. Renita Weems. We do ask that you just Godless. hang in there with us. Um, she'll be with us shortly. And um, and so we normally do this at the end of the show. But Dr. Bradford, if you could go ahead and let our um, viewing audience know who our upcoming guests um, are um, for the rest of the month so they can have that and, and then we can, we'll get back to this conversation. Dr. Sarita, um, I, I want you to say who's coming next week. Um, we'll have, next week we'll have Dr. Um, Dr. Melanie, Melanie Jones, it'll be Dr. Melanie Jones, and then we will have Dr. Sarita. Stacia Williams. Stacia Williams with Williams Financial, and she is going to come and give us some very valid information that we need to know about our money because women manage money equally as well and sometimes better than yeah. the men. Oh, so yeah. if you want to know about your retirement, your 401k, ladies, get your questions on the platter so that mm -hmm. you will be able to ask her these things. And we look forward to having a wonderful time. Yeah, I love that. And the last week of the month, last week of this history, Women's History Month is none other than the Reverend Dr. Melva Sampson. Pink Robe Chronicles. Oh, you don't want to miss any of this month or any of them, period, because um, God is going to show up and just show out. I'm loving this. I'm loving this month. What do you, What about y'all? I am too, yes. It's Herstory Month. Let's do Herstory. it. 
Well, since since we're waiting, would you like for me to go ahead and I can um, go ahead and introduce our guest? So when she comes in, we'll be ready. Is that all right? Well, we have none other than the Reverend Dr. Renita J. Weems. She is a biblical scholar, a writer, an ordained minister, and a public intellectual whose scholarly insights into modern faith, biblical texts, and the role of spirituality in everyday lives makes her a highly sought after writer and speaker. She has numerous books, commentaries, and articles on the Bible and prophetic religion to her credit. <clears throat> Among these are Just a Sister Away, wonderful book I might add, I Ask for Intimacy, Battered Love, Marriage, Sex, and Violence in the Prophets, Showing Mary How Women Can Share Prayers, Wisdom, and the Blessings of God. What Matters Most? 10 Passionate Lessons from the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon's, a contemporary, a commentary in Interpreter's Bible, Series Volume 5. Her 1999 book, Listening for God, a minister's journal, journey through silence and doubt. <clears throat> Won the Religious Com Communicators Council's prestigious 1999 Wilbur Award for excellence and communicating spiritual values to the secular media. Ordained an elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church since 1984, Dr. Weems is a former member of the faculty of Vanderbilt University Divinity School, where she was the first African-American woman to be tenured. She is a former William and Camille Cosby visiting professor of Spelman College. And most recently, served as vice president of academic affairs and professor biblical of biblical studies at American Baptist College in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Weems is the first African American woman to earn a PhD in Old Testament. Huh. Let that sink in. Princeton Theological Seminary in 89. She received her MDiv from Princeton Princeton Theological Seminary in 83, a BA from Wesley College. She was the first African-American woman to deliver the prestigious Lyman Beecher Lecture at Yale University. Dr. Weems is featured in Black Stars, African-American Religious Leaders, a collection of biographies biographies of some of the most important Black religious leaders over the last 200 years, including some impressive figures as Adam Clayton Powell, Elijah Muhammad, Sojourner Truth, Howard Thurman, and Dr. Martin Luther King. Reverend Dr. Renita Weems lives with her family in Nashville, Tennessee, where these days she relishes both being able to return to her first love, which is writing. When not writing and enjoying her favorite two hobbies, biking and quilting, mm -hmm. she co-pastors with her husband, the Reverend Martin L. Espinosa, the Ray of Hope Community Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Weems and her husband are, pr are the proud parents of, the, of a daughter, Savannah Nia. Amen. Come on and put put in the chat section. Welcome, Dr. Weems. Welcome, Dr. Weems, whenever she comes in. We're excited that the Lord is going to show us and share with us today. Amen. Oh, look, I'm honored. Maxine Pruitt, you're honored. All right. We are AME. That's right, Pastor Stalwell. <laughs> All right. So what else are we talking about this morning, this afternoon? Oh, wow. Back to yeah, uh, we go, we Prince get our stimulus Prince Harry and wow. Megan. We supposed Wait. to get our stimulus checks. <laughs> That's what they told me. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Thank God. No, no, no. No. Hi, I'm here. I'm here. Take a I ran breath, out of Dr. my doctor's Wayne. office, but I'm here. 
Take a breath. Take a breath. How Must are be you? Probably calling somebody to see if I've had a dementia attack, but I'm here. Oh no, yes, no, we were yes. well equipped. We understood what was going on. Oh, good. We, thank you. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah. Well, and thank you for uh, rushing. I know you were rushing. Just take take a little breath, and we'll be you'll be all right. I'm, I'm cool. I got it. I got it now. Just trying to. Yeah, I had a. You know, when you get a certain age, they make you have these doctor appointments. So I had the doctor's appointment and I just want you to know, I really did run out after I saw the doctor, but we're not on, we're, we're not being broadcast, are we? So I don't want to tell anybody. <laughs> so I called my assistant on the way, on the way, um, God, I'm talking too much and I just got online. So, you know, I must be having a high right now. But That's so I right. called my sister Peggy and I said, Peggy, call the doctor's office and tell them she did not have a dementia attack. She's not, nobody has kidnapped her. She's not sick. She, she just had an appointment because I think they think that I'm an old lady who has just wandered out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them, I got are, some oh, girls to go see. I got some girls to go see. I got to go right. with my girlfriends. <laughs> you got to gotta hang with some girlfriends, and I'm loving it. Me too. <laughs> I'm loving it. Well, Hello, everybody. It's good to be joining you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for being with us on today. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody's already um, saying welcome, welcome. Um, we have a lot of, yeah, a lot of people yeah, on there. See that. They're excited. Yeah. We just want to know a little yeah. bit, how, how are you doing and how are you doing? And we this is the first question we ask all of our guests. How are yeah. you doing COVID streets? Yes, you know, and, and I, I was, can I just say again, uh, one of those questions on the medical exam is, how are you doing? Is there a lot of stress in your life? Is anybody harming you? <laughs> so, so my answer is, I'm doing pretty well. It is COVID. I am, uh, oh, I think one of the things we say here, I'm struggling well. And uh, oh, so all, wow. all is well. And compared to a lot of other people, I'm very blessed. Uh, but also it has been a struggle, but it's been a good struggle. Thanks wow. for asking. That's that's a good answer. I love that answer. Well, Dr. Williams, I, I want to say to you, um, I graduated from um, the ITC way back in way back. <clears throat> way back. Um, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. but but you preached at um, my graduation. You were, were mm -hmm. my um, commencement um, speaker and um, it has stayed with me all of these years later. But you asked the mm -hmm. question, what do you do? when the bush mm -hmm. stopped burning. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just a few, few years back. But yeah. Day, but yeah. day before yesterday. Day before yesterday. <laughs> day before yesterday. I got you. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. I, but you know what? I mean, I, and I'll, I, honestly, I, I hear a lot about that message and I hear, I encounter a number of graduates from ITC of that particular year who re, who often remind me of how impactful uh, that message was. So thank you very much. I never tire. I never tire of hearing. You. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Well, we we know that you are an Old Testament scholar, mm -hmm. and we a lot of I'm sure a lot of people want to know these questions or know the answers to these questions. So. How do we help women process the injustice found in an mm -hmm. unjust text? For example, mm -hmm. the concubine woman who was cut into 12 pieces yeah. in Judges yeah. 19. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Oh, uh, is that, uh, okay, I thought you were getting ready to go through the whole litany oh, of Oh, oh no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big, big question, and uh, I think it's a very important question. It gets to the to a, another kind of question, if we can kind of bite down on it a little bit and say, it is what we, what do we do with troubling texts, period? What do we do with what, and when I was in seminary, a very popular text uh, in biblical studies and feminist biblical studies was a uh, uh, text of terror. Text of terror. And, um, and it was um, Phyllis yeah. Tribbles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. text of terror. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with these troubling texts? What do we do with these texts um, that are that terrorize us as contemporary readings? And the stories themselves are terrible stories in themselves. So, so it's a question, there are a number of questions here. What is this text doing in the Bible? It raises questions for us. What do we, 
What do we do with these kinds? What is it doing there? What do we do with these kinds of texts in the Bible? And, but I think it's, if I can step back and say, it also makes us question and raise the other question. Um, is the Bible only the Bible if it tells us good stories, if it tells mm. us stories that we we feel that are, um, you know, that are just and uh, reasonable and we can understand why they are there. And even if it is a, a text of terror, are we assuming then, therefore, it is a story that is trying to say, and, and now go and do likewise? And I think that that is, I think that for on, there are a number of levels at which these kinds of stories ought to certainly trouble us, but also trouble the ways in which we have been taught to read the Bible. And in this case, first and foremost, these are not stories. This, this is not a story, certainly not for us who are contemporary readers, that is there to tell us, and now go and do likewise. It is not that kind of prescriptive story. It is not a story that says, it's not even a story necessarily where you get a sense that uh, it, is a t it is trying to suggest to us that this is a way of living and a, and a way of doing. There is a kind of inherent critique. There is something excessive about it. There is something so injurious about it. It's something so ex excessive about it that the writer already assumes that readers are already offended, know that this is horrible. This is atrocious. This is excessive. This is violence at the at the uh, on steroids. I think even the writer assumes readers who would agree with that. And while there is no voice that comes from out from heaven or from God, or no prophet who says this is wrong, because that's what we really want. We want somebody, some mediating voice, and we we're really asking the question because we're saying. What in the world is it doing in there? And uh, it is meant to offend our senses. And it, it does offend our senses, even if it was, um, it, even if it was not outside the norm of that particular era, it still was, in fact, and is uh, an excessively violent uh, story. And I saw my point, I mean, to just sort of kind of cut to the chase to say that the point of us being readers, of us being women readers, of womanist readers, black women readers, thinking women of faith readers, we have the right and the responsibility to reject, to critique, to, dis, to unmask, uh, deconstruct, exegete uh, these kinds of texts. And, and, and you don't have to have an MDiv, a Master's of Divinity. You don't have to be a divinity student. You definitely don't have to have a PhD. You just got to be a thinking person. Um, when we hear the stories of, of Howard Thurman's grandmother or, or women who were, who were slaves or former slaves or just thinking women who have read texts and men who have read texts and say, no, that, that ain't no God. No, no, that don't sound like God. Uh, that's not the will of God in, for my life anyway. Um, so you don't have to have a PhD. It helps to have those kinds of skills. It helps to, to be a student of the Bible with some you know, theological training. But you just really have to say something is wrong here. Something is amiss here. So I, I wanted to kind of come at that answer in, in those kinds of ways to say it's a troubling text. It's a text of terror. And it deserves our, our most fierce uh, kind of exegesis and critique, and war. It's a, it's a, it comes with a. It ought to come with a warning sign. Oh, wow! It was that. Wow. Was that oh, yeah, extremely now, you know, so. I, oh. My sisters, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I know of some of you, but I don't know all of you. So I don't know if this is a conservative uh, platform. <laughs> I don't know if this is a literal yes. platform. Listen. I don't know if y'all yes. we, we, we are a, we are a fundamental conservative. That's the Bible. The Lord said it. And that had, I don't know y'all like that, but you invited me to come on. So I see you can do that, y'all. It ain't me. I'm a liberation. Okay, that ain't me. That ain't me. I, 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 I give you somebody else's name. I'll get you another reference. <laughs> this is not what you're looking for. But I Listen, think if you, you want to renew the wings, 
We know what we were asking for, so come on in the house. I brought my Bible today to hold it close to my heart. <laughs> Stop playing. Let's move on the house. We know what time it is. This is what, this is what the people have been asking for. Um, I want to ask you a question that's in the, in the text, though. Um, Pastor Stallworth is saying, what is the purpose of that text, though? I mean, she literally just asked the question. So what's the purpose of it? I'm like, oh. Well, I mean, if we talk about the purpose, I mean, you know, there are a number of different kinds of purposes. But obviously, on, on one level, the purpose of it is to uh, galvanize the tribes. Is it not? It is supposed to be a story about bring, bringing the tribes uh, and, and to some kind of galvanizing them to, to war and to, to, uh, to, to unite them. Uh, and uh, and and to incense the tribes of, against about what has happened to this woman, and that this woman represents um, um, the Levites' concubine represents, if you will, um, Israel and all of that. And so there, I mean, it it is it is completely offensive uh, by all means. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to those of us who are 21st century Christians. So wh whatever way I describe it, you're going to like, no, you have to come another way for me. But in that world of that text and in the world of those ancient readers, they, I, I would assume that they too would have been horrified. I don't want to think that gratuitous violence, like what we've seen, someone would have listened to it and just said, oh, okay. I, it, there was, there, there is an excessive gratuitous kind of violence that is there that the average reader or listener, if you will, in the ancient world would have found violent as well. But they would have probably um, if they had to weigh it against the larger male narrative, mm. which is about war and mm -hmm. about uh, shame and honor, then they would have they would not have seen her life as important as the larger issue of shame and honor in ancient in the ancient world of tribe the ancient tribal right. world. Mm -hmm. like shame and a man. Lord help us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really yes. I really like wow. that text saying that it was to galvanize because yeah. it, it reminded mm -hmm. me of Trayvon Martin, George mm -hmm. Floyd, and what is happening now, even though they were awful things that happened. Uh, Taylor. Uh, uh, Great. Brianna, I'm all, all of the of our uh, people we've lost uh, in the last two years, at least. Um, yes. And it has galvanized Black Lives Matter. It has yeah. galvanized people marching. It. Yes. So I can. I, I thank you for that because it, it does give me purpose mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. the, sometimes bad things happen, so good people will act. So, Ooh, yes, I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I guess, the, but the other question I would push and say and ask us as because we are all are, are women who are thinking women of faith, um, even in our own contemporary lives, has the has the murder and the violence against women galvanized us? Do we have us? Do we have stories uh, and examples of of uh, the the murder and the violence against black women? The stories of black women who have been murdered over this period as well, does it have the same power? Do those stories have the same power to bring us to the streets and say, no more, this is wrong, and to galvanize us? What is it about the Black male body oh. uh, that galvanizes us in a way that it seems sometimes that, the, that, that violence against women does not generate the same kind of response, out outrage, the same kind of mm -hmm. outrage? I mean, I mean, you you see that now, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. I mean, yes, all day long, like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. So yes. yeah, I mean, you you're yeah. in the house. Yeah. Um, that, Dr. Williams, let me let me ask you this. This is a different text, and um, back in 2019, um, it was um, we, we spent some time in my congregation looking at the life of David um, in a way that not not just the one who knew was after God's heart, not, not that, that day, <laughs> looking at the life of David. And so one of the stories we came across is, is the one dealing with, with Absalom. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about the rape of Tamar. We're talking mm -hmm. about what is happening, the tension that is occurring. Mm -hmm. but, but I asked this question to them um, 
one night, didn't pick it up the following, but I, I have this question for you. What, why do you believe um, in this story that God is silent during this entire time? We do not hear in the quote from the, in the from story the voice, of Tamar. Right, in the rape of Tamar. Well, um, uh, now let me let me. Now the, I mean that's an excellent question, and again, it gets back to our, our assumptions about reading the Bible. And um, let me. There are stories that are told that are there that are canonized in the Bible, and, and obviously here we're talking about the what we call Old Testament or, or Hebrew Bible, and they don't all, the the obvious moral reason. For, there's no prophet who comes on the scene. There's no Nathan mm -hmm. who comes on the scene. There's no mm -hmm. Elijah who comes on the scene uh, and says, this is wrong, or you should not have done that. And so in the absence of a, a mediating moral voice, voice of a moral figure, we are left asking ourselves, so what's the point of this story? If, if God, quote unquote, doesn't intervene through the voice of a prophet or a priest or some mediator, then we're like, how dare this story be here? And are we normalizing rape uh, and, uh, in, by, by there not being a story? And, and, and again, um, so let me tell you another thing that I often would say to my particular, well, to divinity students when they took my Old Testament class. And I would say, I can say that to you all. On one level, I would here's how I would usually introduce my, my classes, divinity classes in Old Testament. I would say, listen, this is not a course on what God said. This is a course on what Moses said, God said. This is not a course on what God said. This is a course on what Jeremiah said, God said. This is not a course on what Isaiah, what God said. <laughs> Of course, yes. of what I told us, God said. Y'all want to hear what God said? Go talk to the theologians. I am a Bible scholar. I just tell you what they say God said. Okay, let's say. All right, now for some people that just went right over their head, they don't have any answer. I'm just talking about. On Sunday, I talk about what God said. Monday through Friday and Saturday, I talk about what Moses said, God said. That's what it means Love to get a piece. That's what it means to get a, that's what it means to be a thinking person. That's what it means to get a degree. That's what it means to become a scholar of the Bible. You look at sources, you look at who wrote it. You look at when they wrote it. You look at why did they write it. You look at who benefits from the telling of this story. Who gets, who benefits from the preaching of this story. Um, and, and that's what it means um, that's what Bible studies should be about. That's what one of the things we try to do in Bible studies. And that's what good texts that you read in Bible study ought to help you to do to understand the history behind these stories. And these stories are not, this is not, they're not all, the moral meaning of them are not always apparent. Um, and, and sometimes there, sometimes there is no moral meaning. Uh, sometimes there are stories that are there because David was important, not because there was a moral point to the story. It was these are stories associated with King David. King David, there is there was no other. I mean, he was the man after God's own heart, and so all, even his good, his his positive and his negative stories are both there. The stories about him as a hero and the stories about him as a villain are there. The stories about the good side of his family and the good, bad side, because that's how those writers would have thought about it. They had no idea that millions of years later, thousands of years later, we would be reading these as moralizing texts. Now, of course, I'm doing some whole, I'm doing some deep Bible, you know, uh, biblical scholarship right now. We love it. I know most people are reading. We love it. it. Love it. Right love it. Now, they just want to know what does Jesus say about this? What does the Holy Ghost say about this? All of that is nice, but I want to know what Jesus wants me to know about this. Story. But that's I, not I, why we're here today. That's not why we're here today. No, 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 you, you, I, you I got somebody. I'm going to send you my girlfriend next week to answer that question for you. But I'm out <laughs> That's not what I do. That ain't Listen. what I do. That ain't what I do on Tuesdays. Okay. You right. in the house. Do you hear me? Come on here. All right. All right. right. I, I'm, I'm asking us to push. I'm asking us to yeah. think. I'm asking us to query the text. Mm -hmm. I'm asking us to query this inherited tradition that we have. And I'm asking us to 
be bold enough and black girl magic enough to ask questions and to say, no, we reject this. We reject this as a morally normative text. We reject this as an example of how we, if anything, it had best be in there because this is how we are not supposed to live. Thank you not so much. Dr. It is what Ooh. the way we supposed to live. Thank you, because you just walked Ooh. right into my into my question. Oh, you walked right into my question, and I love it. Um, at this uh, juncture in your life, mm-hmm. um, those of us who love exegeting the text mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and reflecting upon the text after the exegesis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, How mm-hmm. might you look at Hagar now? And would you send Hagar in a liberating world back to Sarah? Hmm. I mean, now that's, yeah, that is, that, that's an excellent question. Um, that, you know, if, if you, those who've read Justice Sister Way know that that is one of those stories uh, that I, I do look at. And it's interesting that you raise that because I was, I was um, on my on Facebook. I just did a a um, let's say a Facebook live a broadcast this past weekend on, weekend on why I wrote Just a Sister Way, mm-hmm. and I I might have mentioned um, you know the circumstances under which I wrote Just a Sister Way, those Bible study lessons, how they emerge, and and certainly the story of uh, Sarah and and Hagar. Um, and I do believe that even in Justice Sister Way, I do mention that it is problematic that she has been sent back. She gets sent back uh, to Sarah. And now, at that point, 33 years ago, can you believe that Justice Sister Way is 33 years old? 33 years ago, when I wrote it, I, like a good Black evangelical Protestant interpreter, I tried to make sense of why she was sent back, of course. So what do you do when you are the black evangelical, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost field? Because the Bible just got to make sense. And so it surely can't be any problem with God. And it's certainly no problem with the Bible. So the problem got to be with me. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I, I argue that she was sent back because the angel asked her, where have you come from and where are you going? She was able to answer where she had come from. I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. But the part of the question that she did not ever answer was, and where are you going? And so like a, like a, like a, you know, the, the, the interpreter that I was certainly back then, I would argue, and probably I would do the same if I was preaching it on Sunday, but we're here, we're doing this on Tuesday. But if I was preaching this on Sunday, I would probably say that the reason why she was sent back is because she could not answer where she was going. And if you don't have any idea where you're going, then you, then you, you have to stay where you end up staying where you are. And so I, I certainly, in just a sister way, I, I posited that she was sent back because she could not answer the set, the second part of uh, of the the question. It is not a liberating moment in the text for her to be sent right. back. It's right. not a liberating moment in the text um, that she sent back into servitude and and slavery uh, by by any stretch of the uh, imagination. But in my attempt to try to make sense of it, I certainly mm-hmm. made that kind of posit. Now, 33 years later, I probably would not be so glib about that. I would probably challenge the whole notion of the, the angel. Yeah. Oh, I, certainly, I would problematize it anyway. I would just say that we have a problem here. You know, I was she, was getting, she was getting water and, and food under the tree. Uh, that was, you remember that two parts of the story. That's chapter 16 and then that's chapter 21. But yes, she has certainly... Uh, What's the past tense of flee, y'all? Fled? Yeah, she has fled. certainly fled. Okay, mm-hmm. she has certainly mm-hmm. fled. And yes, mm-hmm. but the angel does encounter her and meet her. You're you're absolutely correct. Well, thank wow. you. Because as a liberation theologian, I'm going to turn yeah. it on the head and say, well, she went back, y'all. But today, I would not tell y'all to stay in those battered situations. Today, right. I would tell you to find a friend. I would tell you to yes. go somewhere else. I would tell you to leave that situation if you yes. if um, it's un- unjust and it is and you're being battered and harassed and yeah. hurt. 
I, I would, I would, I would definitely. Because, because if you don't, you very well to end up into twelve pieces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Good point. Good point. Today, um, there's a question in the comments section, um, Alisa Cupid. Um, how do we understand God in the midst of the violence, genocide, sexual assault, etc.? And she has a, a two part. You want to deal with that one, and then we'll ask the other one. Yeah, you know, you you know, the, that's one of those that's one of them huge questions, you know, uh, that can't probably necessarily be answered on on a platform like this. I mean, that how do we how do we understand uh, God? I mean, I, it gets back to how we understand the Bible, and then therefore, um, do you worship the Bible or do you worship God? Mm. And is God, mm. and is God and the Bible the same thing? Uh, and 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 if your your only mediating knowledge about God is through the Bible, then you then you got a problem. Hello. Okay. Let's let's just be clear about that. I love this text. I've given my life to this text. This text has been a blessing to me. But I also want to admit, and I'm willing, just like the church. I love the church. I love the black church. It has been a blessing to me, but it has been a love hate relationship in terms of the church, and it certainly, in terms of the Bible, it has been a it has been a pull and a tug and a struggle with certain parts of it. And while when I was young, I thought like a young person. I read like a, a young person, and I interpreted like a young person. And whenever there was a problem that I encountered in the Bible, I figured it had to do, the problem was mine. It couldn't possibly be with the Bible because that's how I had been taught to read and understand the Bible. I don't, I no longer read it like that. And, and I, I consider questioning it holy work. I, I think researching, questioning and exegeting and being online right here. And being in the chat room and having these conversations, I think this is part of my Lenten devotional. Uh, I think this. I, I, I think that I'm like I'm like Habeka. I raise hell with God. How long shall I see violence and you do not answer? And what's up? And what's up with you sending them Babylonians down here to kill us? And, and they're, they're not even no better than we are. You know where are you? Oh, speak up right now. I, I, I think you better come up. I'm like, Joe, what, whoa, 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 what's up here? What's this? So I, I think that we probably have not done as good a job, particularly those of us in that kind of Protestant, evangelical, very conservative. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You know, God, you know, uh, the, that's nothing wrong with the Bible. It is inerrant. It is authoritative. And whatever all of that means, it usually means to squash all questions. And, and if we did not question, then us as women, one, we would not be doing ministry. We would not even have the, we would not have permission to even to have this kind of a platform to be talking about the Bible. If we did not question, Black people would still be slaves. Uh, if, if we did not question. So again, I always say you don't have to have a degree. You just have to have a mind. You And you have to have somebody have modeled for you. And and I want to and I do want to make this kind of plug. I am grateful. Long before I went to seminary, I sat up under. I had the. I now know I, what I didn't know back then. I now know that I was incredibly blessed that I sat up under some thinking preachers and pastors, creative, imaginative, and. And you are only as good as your dialogue partners, quite frankly. <laughs> and if you are, if you sit up under people who, who you, who, when you listen to them, to them, you don't even get a sense that they struggle with anything, that they have any questions, that they have ever raised their fist at God, that they themselves have never asked God, why, how come, how long, even how dare you? Even the Jews do you know I mean, you don't go through the Holocaust and not and not you know raise some questions with God. You know that I love the story of one of the Jewish stories of the of uh, the rabbis who who um, were in a room uh, and I think Eli Eli Wiesel tells this story uh, railing with God and how could you and they had their fists to the sky and and when and when the hour for prayer came they donned their shawl. And put over and began to pray. So on one level, they could fuss with God and then to pray to God. 
fuss with God and then pray to God. And the, the Bible is full of stories of people who on one level argue, disagree, cry, lament, the lamentations, and then at the same time praise, thank God, bless God, and all of that is in the Bible. And that is what makes it rich to me because it doesn't have only one way to enter into conversation with God. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk is yes. one of my favorite um, books in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And he's fussing with God. And at the end, I think it's in what, verse 16, 17, he finally realized, oh, I'm tired of fussing with God. <laughs> okay, let me let me just go ahead and say, okay, though the fig trees may, whatever they're going to do. Yeah. You are the yeah. joy, the God of my salvation. And you're talking about, oh, you're going to make my feet like hinds feet. Yes, but you're yes, talking yes. about then and now and how you see things differently. Do you think that Habakkuk just saw it differently? It's like, dang, okay, God, okay, here we are. Now, what do I do with all of this? I'm on this wall. Now, what do I do with it? Yeah. And because somewhere earlier, he does say, Habakkuk, the prophet does say, the just shall live by faith, right? Yeah. I mean, so, that, that, so before he gets to the last chapter, I think that's the fourth chapter, he, he does Third. say, uh -huh. that, yeah, that's right. Hey, hey, listen, the just shall live by faith. And I would, and I agree with you. That's what I love about uh, books like um, uh, Habakkuk, books yeah. like the, the Book of Lamentations. The, the the laments themselves there in the in the book of Psalms, uh, I, and uh, and and all the major prophets Jeremiah I love you know is there no bomb in Gilead all, all of these we tend to domesticate these these particular uh, Psalms, um, but. <laughs> I mean, even, even but but our, all our, our spirituals. I mean, I think in James Cone's book about the black spirituals, uh, our spirituals are oftentimes and and the blues themselves are oftentimes lyrical ways of asking God. You know, I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from what oh, you know. Uh, a weeping may you know uh, endure for the night, but joy come. I mean, that that also was music that we created as as people of color going through suffering and slavery and saying, you know, this is hard, but I love you, God. I, you know, I don't understand you, God, but I'm going on through with you, God. Though you yeah. slay me, I'm, I ain't going nowhere, but I just, I, but I do want to acknowledge you are slaying me now. Okay. So let's just get that clear. You know, I love you. But I don't like what you're doing, but I love you. I don't understand what you're doing, but I do love you. Yeah. And by when the morning comes, and all the saints of God gather. We going we gonna tell the story. We'll understand it better. I mean, so all of that was our people's way, also of saying some of the stuff that's not adding up. If if in theodicy and theology we learn, if God is good, yeah. If God is all powerful, and if God is all knowing, then why is there suffering? I'll say it again. If God is good, if God is all powerful, and if God is all knowing, then why is there suffering? Now the Jews have an answer. Though I mean, they're not all Jews, but some Jews come in with. In the light of Holocaust, one of them three, or not all, two of them three, if not all three of them threes, got to be challenged. Yes, and they, they've already they've already they already down the road and said, listen, in light of eight million Jews being slaughtered by Hitler. Either God is evil or we need to rethink our theology. <laughs> that's what they that's what that's what serious theologians who are wrestling with this. Is, is it God or is it our propositions about God? Can you live with a God who is not all powerful? Can you live with a God who is powerful but is not all seeing and all knowing? Can you live with a God who all three of them who says I ain't gonna do nothing but just sit here with you while you hurt and cry with you. That's it. That's it. And you're like, well, you're not gonna, you're not gonna vindicate me. You just gonna sit here and cry with me. Let me think about that. Let me think about that one. And for and for some of us, so for some people, that that's where some theology is going now. The God who, who is with us. Yeah, that's the pastoral care moment. Who, yeah. who hurts with us who feels with us, but who will not overrule 
right. our will, human will, and human choice, and human and 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 uh, human sin, but that God will walk with us through the valley and the shadow of death, but may not change our circumstances. Ooh. Now, girl, this this calls for some real Kool Aid to talk about. Oh, wait this. a minute! Wait a minute! You keep talking about this wrestling. You keep talking about wrestling and and trying to figure this out and and trying to. This is a process that we have to go through. We have to get from this to this. What do you mean wrestle? I don't understand this wrestle. And you have a, a a lot of people in in the text. I'm a wrestle. How am I wrestling with the text? And I don't understand what's going what I'm doing. What's going on in my own life? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that let's see, this is this is why we get into these kind of conversations. This is why we have these platforms. That's this is the beauty of this kind of show, um, to to uh, to kind of usher us into the deeper waters. Now, don't be now don't be wrestling in shallow water now. Like somebody somebody asked a question. Somebody asked a question. I was looking at that saying, now, baby, we we way out into deeper water than that question right there. We can't come back and ask that little question right there. That, that's that's for your Sunday school class. Girl, we out here deep. We out here with sharks. Huh? I can't come double on. back and ask an answer for you, this little question you asking. But but God bless you now. Now, God bless you. But we are here in deeper water right now. So I'm, that's and that's what this kind of platform and, and what you all have created. This is this is the, that's that's the beauty and I think the ministry of this work that you are doing and you, and you are inviting us to be a part of. I I love it. Do you know how, when the last time I had this kind of conversation with black women? God, I'm so I'm having a good time. I'm having a good time. Listen, Listen I, I deal with so much shallow stuff. I'm like, woo! Four sisters who want to talk about something. Girl, pass the Kool Aid. Let's keep talking. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> Kokisha talking about Kool-Aid and Kool-Aid pickles. You hear me? <laughs> but I, um, I, I see I see uh, what is it? Tanya has pot a liquor, question. Pot liquor. Go ahead. Pop liquor, girl. Uh, mm-hmm. Give me some. Tanya, Tanya Nixon asks, is it God or is it our proposition about God? If God is good and all knowing, why is there suffering? Russell in deep water. Oh, that's a good question, mm-hmm. girl. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that we are challenged. We are challenged. You know, if we are ministers, those of us who certainly are pastors and ministers, and those of us who just live life, surely um, you we have we have experienced and we have walked with people who have experienced deep moments of pain and anguish when even we ourselves have to say, this doesn't make sense. This is wrong. Whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter or we're talking about deaths or disease or trouble or suffering in our own personal individual lives, you cannot tell me you can get to a certain age of 30 and 40, certainly 50 and 60, and not at some point, something has happened that make you say, it makes you challenge makes you challenge it makes everything you have believed be challenged you know everything 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 is on the table now if if you haven't just keep living you know Uh, that kindergarten theology is is going to be challenged you know that kind of kindergarten theology even that naming and claiming well i'm just i I, you know god said it i believe this is just the way that it is it's the old and now at some point life it will throw you, throw something at you that will so shake everything you have ever believed in that either you will either and, and there's a book uh, by Joan Chittister who I love Joan Chittister C H I T T I S T E R Joan Chittister it's called Scarred by Struggle Transformed by Hope and oh, she says, wow. She's a, she's a, uh, say, say it again. Say it again. Star, a, uh, scarred Joan Chittister. I mean, a, a Catholic nun. I mean, Catholic liberation nun. Is, liberation is feminist. I mean, she's she's serious. Wow. Um, but she Scar- but the book is the called Scarred, Scarred by Struggle, mm-hmm. Transformed by Hope. Wow. I, I, I mention this book almost everywhere I go when I'm talking about suffering. And she talks yeah. about suffering comes and it makes you, you've got to either become, you either become bitter 
or you become better. Mm -hmm. It comes and it makes you have to rethink everything you have ever been taught about God. And you've got to make some decisions. And, and some people decide they're going to plow right through. They're not going to ask any questions. They're just going to hold on to God. But if you scratch them on the right day, they are just as bitter about bitter about life and God. I'm not going nowhere, but I'm mad at you. And I'm going to be mad at you forever. Uh, I ain't going nowhere. But I ain't going to never forgive you, God, for what you did. And I'm going to treat everybody in church like I don't forgive you for what you did. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that happens a lot I'm in the church. You, and I'm at every Negro up in here as well. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. you, you got that. You and But also, I think that what she's saying that I don't believe that I, I had can This is my 10th year of being cancer free after mm -hmm. breast cancer and uterine cancer simultaneously. Yeah. Within within three weeks, I got both. I got diagnosed with both because I just gone for my annual exam, had the had the uh, mammogram, and I you know had the uh, gynecological exam, and and I got both. And and uh, you don't go through that without and being a minister and a well known high platform. I, I ain't never known nothing but tithing. I've been in the Pentecostal church. You know, I just you know even when I became Methodist, I was I mean, you know all the stuff you can call up to God. You know, I'm a tithing woman. I, I believe that, you know, oh Lord, you know the locusts. Mm -hmm. I the God. I, you know, I girl everything. I, I can go through them scriptures now, just like <laughs> anybody else. But here you have a di double diagnosis of cancer. Right. Everything is put on the table. All your theology, all your training, all of your understanding about God. And either you decide this has all been a lie or you decide that God is a cruel God. Or you sit back and say, maybe it is time for me to rethink how I have been taught about God. And, and and I think that the teaching was important and I and I honor that teaching, but maybe it is time for us. And what what's the point of being black women in the in ministry? What's the point of being black women who can read the biblical text if we are not going to bring the best of our skills mm -hmm. to say to our people, listen, um, it, it's time for us to rethink some things. And maybe maybe this toxic theology that we have inherited has done more harm than good. Maybe that's why our children don't want to come to church. Well, Maybe that's why we're losing a whole generation because we're not keeping it real. We have we 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 deny them the right to argue with God, to argue with this Bible, to argue with the church, to argue <laughs> with traditions. And they have gone because we are all about pie in the sky and you don't question God and you don't question the Bible. And we are losing a generation who said, that's not going to work for us. Right. You're going to have to come up with something else. Well, you said toxic. toxic. <laughs> oh my God. Toxic. You know, that, oh that wing, she has another book, uh, Joan Chister. Chister. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chister. The, Chister uh, the Time is Now. And that oh, book, yes. that's yes. my ever-loving soul. Ever, she, ever loving that social gospel and uh, social justice, it just it blessed my ever loving soul. Yes, yes, great, great recommendation. She's, she's a, great a good book. writer. Oh God, yes, yes. Co um, Co well, Reverend um, yeah. soon to be Doctor Kokisha Bailey Robinson said, "Detoxify theology." <laughs> Detoxify well, uh, theology. We yes. have. Oh, so, yeah. So, Dr. Reed, we, we, had, we, had, we had this one other question we need uh -oh. to ask you. We got this one other question. Buckle up. Was it an apple? <laughs> and why is Eve demonized for giving Adam the fruit? <laughs> let, let me swim. Yeah. No, hold on. <laughs> well, I said, <laughs> well, let's see here now. As, as old folks said, now, baby. Now, baby. <laughs> Look here. Like, Look here, baby. Wait, grandmama now. <laughs> Let me get my snuff. Let me get some snuff. <laughs> Let me see what I can do with that one right there. <laughs> right yonder. Honey. Honey. <laughs> Jesus said some stuff. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Um, see, it, here's the, here's at least another piece of the pie. Let me, let me, let me, let me just let me just complicate it. Let me let me let me just complicate it some more. There is no, but let me start. Let me ask you to do in all seriousness. Give me the question again because I want to do something with the question. Right. Why did? Okay, first, what? was it an apple? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but why okay. is Eve demonized for giving Adam? Right. Okay. That's, that's the real question. Yeah. We that, that, thank you. Let's, let's go with the real question. <laughs> <laughs> let's, do, let's do with the... I got a PhD. Let me, let, me, let me give that to somebody who don't have a PhD. It wasn't that... Mm -mm, I can't answer that. Okay. All right. So they help me with the real question. Okay. Um, the, the real question mm. is... <clears throat> why do we why do we interpret it that way? Why do we mm. follow that line of interpretation? The question is, see, part of my work as a, as a woman is hermeneutic, hermeneutic, hermeneut is the word, but as a woman as interpreter is to ask questions, it's not so much what does the Bible say, but why have we interpreted in a particular kind of manner? And that's what I am trying to push even our audience to think about. That there is part of our work now in the 21st century as womanist scholars, as womanist biblical interpreters, as thinking women of faith, is to begin to ask not only what does the Bible say, but why do we hold to certain texts over some other texts? Why have we only allowed certain kinds of interpretations and never, not other kinds of interpretations. But even more importantly, who benefits from this interpretation? That is, why would I get into the pulpit and preach as though I am a man and Come interpret on. as though I am a man and read the Bible as though I am a man? You, you see, it depends upon where you stand. Now, I, I'm not saying there is a, you know, every text is there's a feminine or a woman way to read a text, but there are some gender dynamics underlying texts and underlying our interpretation of text that ought to make us sit there like the old mother on the motherboard and say, hmm, I don't know about that. Exactly. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm if, if anything, uh, take ye authority <laughs> to question. Yes. Take ye authority to question the text, to question the interpretation of text. No, not to create anarchy. I mean, I know it's like, woo, well, where is it going to lead? Where it's going to lead is into deeper regions of conversation. And to be able to say, um, this is interpretation to the best of my understanding, and this is the interpretation, and I'm a part of a community. And what keeps us from getting way out there is that we, I love the fact that I'm not being interviewed and in having a conversation with one woman. There are four of you. You have created a community. You have cre created a church, if you will, to bounce off of each other. For somebody to say, okay, girl, that's a little wild. Now come on back a little bit. Here. Come on back. That's just a little too deep. Come on back. And somebody else said, that's a little shallow. You need to come on out a little deep. That is why the Bible was never interpreted and read by individuals. It was always a communal event. Yes. The reading of stories, the telling of stories, the reading of the Bible, the interpretation of the Bible, this notion of in my private study and my private talk with God and my private interpretation. That's very Western. That's very, uh, uh, not just Western, that's very empire interpretation. That's empire Bible study. Mm. The individuals hear God by themselves, understand God by themselves, read the Bible by themselves. That's, that's what empires empower slave masters to think. Ooh. But, but the Bible, the the, the, the ancient Afro-Asiatic world of, of the uh, uh, ancient world was a world where communities got together and read yeah. and heard stories and raised questions and challenged. 
and and decided where the parameters were for themselves. You did an interview a couple of weeks ago about, um, I think you were talking about grandmom and him. Uh, yes, with uh, Dr. Yolanda Pierce. Exactly. And you you talked about community and how um, grandma, you sat with grandmothers and how they taught you and you didn't always have anything to say, but you were always listening. And if we as black women can listen to each other, oh, how much further will we be? Yeah, great point. Uh, excellent. I, I think it um, it taps into. And again, let me see if I have her book um, in my grandmother's house. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is Yolanda Pierce's In My Grandmother's House. Again, yeah. I, I mean, if, we, if we salute Joan Chittister, let me make sure I salute Yolanda Pierce. In Fair my grandmother's girl. house, black women, faith, and the stories we inherit. In Fair my grandmother's girl. house, black women, faith, and the stories we inherit. Yolanda Pierce is the dean at Howard University, Howard University. Divinity School. Mm -hmm. And this is her newest uh, book. And what she does, I mean, she talks about returning to what she calls grandma's theology. And what she's really talking about is where uh, that ancestral ancient wisdom that we have lost, that we live in a, almost a, we live in a generation that is motherless, mm -hmm. that is uh, where we yearn for maternal ancient wisdom. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that it, it would be who all of us who are online right now to one day just sit down and write out all the sayings of your grandmother and mother and auntie Nim. And that kind of wisdom that was distilled to us through them, through their experiences and the little funny sayings and the homegrown kitchen table kind of wisdom that they passed down to us. Uh, and that, that those things were precious. That was that, you know, uh, I, I mean, we all can kind of think of some of that. And, and, and I guess what we're saying is that that was communal. Uh, Ella Baker, uh, oh, the, the, mother, the grandmother of uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, used to say yes. uh, that which, I mean, in the song that Sweet Honey and Rock sings, she said, that which touches me most is that I had a chance to work with people passing mm -hmm. on to others that yeah. which was passed on to me. We who believe in freedom, freedom. cannot rest. Yeah. So that notion that passing on to others, what was passed on to me, not just unfiltered and just therefore just take it, but as a starting point, mm. at least a starting point for conversation and, and for learning, I think is important. Okay, I I got I got to I have to ask this or uh, share this, but that is it really happening? Is it really happening in our community, um, Black women? You know, because some we see some women, some Black women that get to a place and close the door behind them. Mm -hmm. it, is it us? Are we being in a community? Are we in a community where we can share with each other, where we can listen and and breathe on each other so that we can understand what the route is so that we won't have to go the same way? Are we yeah. really doing that? I, mean, I think that's the question. That's the question for your audience. That's the question for all of us. Um, and I mean, I guess the, the answer is some of us are and, and some of us are not. I think mm. that the church is one of the last one of the last places, last safe house for us to commune together and, and to receive some of that and share some of that kind of inherited wisdom. I guess after that, we hope that it's being done in our homes and in our families. I'm not always sure that it's being done in our home and our families, but certainly we, we needed the church for those kind of things. And for those of you, so let me really get my Kool-Aid now. No, no, let me pull my tea. Let me pull some tea now. For those of you who are sorority girls, uh -oh. I don't know if this is happening in your sororities. That's what we don't, don't do, Ames. I That's don't know if you all get together in your colors, if you are really doing those kinds of things, or if you just skiing, weeing, and whatever it all that is. I don't know. 
But wait, next, wait, uh, wait. everybody, everybody is so into their sorority now. Nobody wants what to know if you're Christian or what church you go to. Girl, what sorority are you? I mean, so that's how we. I'm like, okay, do that. Okay, y'all. Well, what y'all doing when y'all up in there? Wait, wait. Ask a doll anything? Okay, you gave some money to some orphanage and some charity and all of that. Nah, that's cute. But in the end, are you moving the needle in black women's lives who don't have that the colors of your sorority? Are you moving the needle? Have you have you have, have you dismantled patriarchy? Are we just wearing pink and green and red and white and blue and whatever so that we can you, get you, out? You can you can just stay with all the colors. You can leave blue, oh, blue, and, blue and white, blue and white, blue and white. I don't know the color. I don't Mid know how I know. I, I, I can bowl down the alley and hit all the balls because I don't know. I'm not, I don't bowl to none of it. So my point is, but so what we doing? What y'all do? If y'all the new church, then Ooh, show, show me your receipts. Show me your receipts. If y'all say, let's leave the church and come on to your sorority and they show me your receipt. What y'all doing? See, look at that. Y'all uh, got, nice got nice shoes and you got nice toenail polish. But what you doing? Wait, hold on. Mm. Not Wait. only did she say, not only did she ask what y'all doing, she had the nerve to look us up and down. <laughs> <laughs> like the old lady on the front porch. She said, you go, uh -huh. what, what you doing? What you doing? What you doing? <laughs> And Jennifer Huston said, where you at? Where you, where you at? at? Where you at? Yes. I think it's important, though, that you ask that question because there are, yes, I'm a sorority girl, girl yes. Mm -hmm. But when we are in these spaces, are we sharing not just the good news? Are we sharing good love space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good love space. Are we sharing um, times together where we can say, I'm hurting and it won't be all over the house? Yeah. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Dr. Weems, this has just been an absolutely powerful discussion with you today. For our viewing audience, you all know that we normally are very timely, time punctured. I'm looking at that, but Dr. Weems was. Um, has, has shared her time with us, was running a few minutes late, and we wanted to make sure that she got that same amount of time that our other guests have. We have been blessed by you, and, mm -hmm. and we, we're we going to go ahead and ask. I know the audience would love to have you back, um, to come back and look at your schedule. I want to also do a shout out to, um, to our guests from last week. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Farrell, for um, for the shout outs you've been doing and for yes. sharing this broadcast yes. on today. We bless God for you. Dr. Yeah. Um, Kokisha Bailey Kokisha? Robinson, thank you for being yes. here with us on today. We bless God and we thank yes. God um, for you. But y'all put it in there. Let us see it. See you say, come back, please. We need more. We need more. Come on. Just That's start right. begging now. And I'm ask her, what, you know, where her receipts? <laughs> ask her. Where your receipts? We need more. Okay. <laughs> I'm already so. working on it. Don't play. I'm already <laughs> okay. Next time, make sure you make sure I come after a doctor's visit again, because maybe I, maybe it's something I come from the doctor that has me so <laughs> right now. I don't know. I'm I'm loving it. You have blessed our souls. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Our, our you all have been a blessing to me. This has been wonderful. Thank you for Grandma Manil. Yes. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for exploring or allowing us to explore different mm. perspectives. Thank you. This has been great. And and as you see in the comments, they're just blowing it up. Everybody says, <laughs> come on back. Come on back. Come on back, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. So we thank yeah. God. And right now I've got it. I'm get, I, I do have to preach in a, you know this this virtual world of uh, worship services where you don't know if on Tuesday night am I going to church or am I going to a pre-recording <laughs> session. I don't know where I'm going, mm -hmm. uh, but I am on my way. I've got to preach, and certainly you all have have uh, certainly inspired me to now go back and look at a, the particular text that I was going to do. And kind of rethink it. So, I mean, all things do work together for good. This has been in this virtual world where we are interviewed and online and Zoomed and StreamYard out and all these conversations. It's, I can tell you over the past year, I would count this as one of, I've had the, I've had the most fun 
in this one right here. Number one, y'all let me cut up. Y'all let me cut up. And, and, and. No, we just let you be you. That's what we're doing. Real, 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 real. This is the most fun. And I didn't have to come and be, you know, Dr. Renita Wings. I could be, you know, I could be around the kitchen table yes. eating catfish. Yes, okay. we eat catfish. Ooh. Ooh. So you done so just messed me up with some catfish. So, oh, so thank you all so very much. Where are you yeah. preaching tonight? Some people are asking. I'm getting like uh, well, text out the text. Yeah, I, on Sunday you can catch me at Ray of Hope Community Church on oh. on on uh, on our Facebook um, live. But I'm the, we we record on Tuesday nights, so I'm and don't be uh, no. See, then then you put pressure on me. Now I got to really preach if y'all gonna be coming over there on Sunday to listen to me. <laughs> Lord, I should have told you. I shouldn't have told you. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna be I can good, preach in my own congregation. I can preach in my own congregation any kind of way. But now y'all coming over. Now I got to bring it. I ain't planning on. Bring Bringing it tonight. <laughs> Let's do the burning bush. Do the burning bush. Just <laughs> <That's all. laughs> stop that burning bush. Right, I'm, on, I'm, I'm on my way have to get hot sauce fish. on it tonight because y'all coming over. But I, yeah, right? I, the Rainbow Community Church in Nashville. So thank you all so very much. This thank you. And just hold on one, one more second for us, sure. Dr. Wings. Thank you, audience. and. Lord says the same. We'll see you next week, three o'clock. Same time, Lewiston. same place. Yeah.